And I want to encourage you that as we continue to stand, and having done all to stand, stand therefore. Stand therefore. Don't lose your hope. You know, and um, we're going to be talking about that today. Um, nine reasons to have hope no matter what is going to be the theme of this today if I can get this thing to work. There we go. And uh, the whole thing we've been doing is having it already. There's nine reasons to have hope no matter what. We're probably going to get through four or five of those today and finish it up next week, okay? Um, but um, if you would turn to Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, and I'm going to read to you 9 through 21. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Romans 9, and I've got the Amplified, the classic version, coming up for you. Oh, I went to 10, how did I do that? <coughs> Golly, all right, here we go. Okay, Romans 12, verse 9. Let me know when you're there, please. And somebody invented an app where you're on your phone app as it goes through the pages and you can hear it. Those preachers like to hear pages turning, so somebody invent that way. That it would make us feel good. Okay. This is in the Amplified. It says, let your love, everybody say, let my love, be sincere, a real thing. It says, hate what is evil, loathe all ungodliness, turn in horror from wickedness, but hold fast to what? That which is good. Here you go, verse 10. It says, love one another with brotherly affection as members of one family. Has any of you in your family ever had controversy or something to deal with besides me? Okay, just, okay, a couple of us. The rest of you are like, I'm not raising my hand. Oh, I'm doing that thing. So. so just raise your hands once so I know that they work. Just do that. Okay, good, thanks. Okay, I'm good. All right, good. I just thought I was in the wrong place, wrong house. It goes, showing. <laughs> it says, men are as one family giving precedence and showing honor to one another. This is talking about, this is your church family he's talking about, okay? Here we go. It says, never lag in zeal and in earth's endeavor. He said, but be aglow and burning with the Spirit serving the Lord. That means no matter what's going on, he didn't say this was conditional. I've asked you not know, what I've been doing through, what I've been walking through. No, and I really, you know, I care. But however, this is what it says. It says, be aglow and burning with the Spirit serving the Lord. Now, Glenn and Midge had an opportunity in their stand to stay aglow and burn with the Spirit, but they did. Did they need encouraged? Yes. Did they quit doing what they were called to do? No. Did they continue to stand and speak the word? Yes. Did they get weary and well doing? Maybe a little bit. But did they quit? No. Exactly. Okay. Verse 12. This will be our, our, our main verse. It says, rejoice and exult in what? Hope. Be steadfast and patient in suffering and tribulation. In their stand for selling that big piece of acres, did they have some suffering and tribulation? Yes. Do we have suffering and tribulation? Yes. Did God say this was going to be an easy walk? No. Was the birth of Jesus an easy birth? No. Was she pregnant out of wedlock? Yes. Can you imagine what all the turmoil and everything that was going against her was all about? All of that that happened. But if you study that birth of Jesus from another through another person's eyes like that, you can remember that it just wasn't a, you know, we, we're all happy at you know, Christmas time celebrating the birth of Jesus. That's wonderful. Do you realize what they had to go through to do that? And for two years they had to hide that little boy because somebody's trying to kill him and take him out. So verse 12 says, result in, and exult in hope because Jesus is the hope of the world, correct? It said, be steadfast and patient in suffering and tribulation and be constant in what? Prayer. Prayer. He said to contribute to the needs of God's people, sharing in the necessities of the saints, pursue the practice of hospitality. Oh, here we come, verse 14. said, bless those who persecute you, who are cruel in their attitude toward you. Anybody have that happen this week? 
Really? You ever been, been driving and somebody pulls right in front of you? I blessed them. I did. I smiled afterwards after the Lord dealt with me. And I did not curse them, which is the last part of that verse. I blessed them and I did not curse them. And he said, rejoice with those who rejoice. So sharing other people's joy. So when Midge and Glid, their good report, you guys rejoice. That's awesome. Because sometimes when something good happens to somebody, I say, oh, that's great for you. Oh, okay. oh, big deal. Big stinking deal. What about me? <laughs> that have, that's, we have an opportunity to do that. We can rejoice. Oh, that's good. <laughs> good. And we don't really mean it. We're not really, okay, oh, good for you. Got everything you wanted. I remember when I sold a piece of property, I didn't get all the hands. We start mumbling and groaning and complaining sometimes. Not you guys. I'm talking about other people who don't know the word, aren't full of the spirit, and all of that. I'm not talking I'm talking about you know other people, not not this family, because because we don't do that, okay? He said, Rejoice those with joys who rejoice, sharing others' joy, and weep with those who weep, sharing others' grief. We are really good about that, it seems like. You know, we we don't mind doing that at all. And it said, live in harmony. With one another. Don't be haughty, snobbish, high minded, or exclusive. You know, it's, it's, it's that sometimes when we come into church, the high church that we walk in and, oh, hello, good morning, how are you? Don't touch me. You know, oh, excuse me, you're in my seat again. Why are you sitting on the front row when you know I sit there every Sunday? You know, we don't have that. He said, don't be exclusive like that. Don't think so. Well, I go to so-and-so church because it's high church and the pastor does not ever make me feel condemned and it's always loving me and I never get challenged by the pastor. So, so please make a way because I'm coming in the aisle. He said, don't do that. He said, but readily adjust yourself to people, things, and give yourself to humble tasks like being a greeter or working in the parking lot, or even more humbling, children's church. <laughs> Everybody says, help me, Jesus. <laughs> you know, you've ever been and worked in the nursery? Oh, yes, amen. God bless you if you have. You know, if we had enough volunteers back there, you'd only have to do it one Sunday a year. Wow. Wouldn't that be awesome? One Sunday a year, yeah. You can get prayed up for that. Okay, yeah. So they pray, they have devotions beforehand. They, they make everything ready and it's all ready to go. They got it all. So you just, one Sunday, this is my Sunday. Okay, I got this. I got this. You know, you want to make sure you hit the buzzer, get up early so you can be ready to go serve. And your one Sunday's over, especially if pastor only preached 30 minutes. But you're looking, dear Jesus, it's quarter to 12. He's still in there. The Holy Ghost fell. People are getting touched and moved and healed. Oh, and gosh, I got to stay with them for a while. What about some of those services that, you know, where the Holy Spirit fell? People were out everywhere. Some of those big things and, you know, the children. Well, it wouldn't be bad if it hit the children's church first. That'd be great. They're all out there and you're going, wow. People are done. Next thing you know, they're having church every night for, you know, 16 months. You know, oh, and that's something. And that's something. He says, uh, give yourself to humble tasks. Never overestimate yourself or be wise in your own conceits. Okay? You don't have to worry about me overestimating myself as far as building something. Okay? I had to put together a, a toy plane for my grandson, turn one on Saturday. And uh, we, Andrea bought this plane and she's recovering from her surgery. And so I had to go find a wrench and a screwdriver. And it said a, a six inch wrench, so I've got my tape measure. Six inches, that's six inches, okay. Then it said something about a half inch. I don't know what that meant. So I figured it was the other part on there. So I tried to, oh, it's got stuff on the side of it. Yeah, mine were all brand new and still in the package, so it was real easy to, to get to. But then the stupid screw wouldn't go in because somehow the, um, what they call like spot welds were just a little bit off. And this metal thing, Andrew's sitting there watching me. We're watching a Hallmark movie. Now I'm sweating. I got the fan going on. I got the door open. And um, she goes, honey, you need any help? No. 
She can't lift anything over two pounds. But I get this screwdriver. And I, oh, Bob, I almost called you. She goes, honey, would it help if you had the electric drill? It doesn't work. The electric drill doesn't work. So the, the, the battery doesn't recharge. But I cranked and I cranked and I cranked. I prayed in the Holy Ghost, you know, and it's still sticking out about that far. Okay. But we got it done. So I didn't repay no one for evil, like the manufacturer made it. But I take thought for what is honest and proper and noble, aiming to be above reproach in the sight of everyone. Verse 18, if possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everybody. It says, verse 19, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave the way open for God's wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I'll repay, I'll requite, says the Lord. Verse 20, he said, if your enemy is hungry, what's it say? Feed him. If he's thirsty, what? Give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will what? He running coals upon his head. And in verse 21, do not let yourself be overcome by evil, but overcome master evil with what? Good, 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 good. All right, here we go. So, if you've ever lost hope, if you've ever been weak in that area, we're going to have some nine points here that will help us to have hope no matter what. Again, Romans 12, 12. Rejoice and exult in hope. Be steadfast and patient in suffering and tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Now, hope is this. We've used the terms, you know, man, I hope I get a new job, or I hope I get healed soon, or I hope my children's going to follow the Lord someday, and, and all of these types of things. Um, a lot of times we've uttered those words without believing that they're ever going to come to pass. Okay, we just, well, hopefully, maybe, que sera, sera, whatever it would be. You know, they can sometimes be laced with discouragement and doubt. And especially when we're facing overwhelming loss. If you've been through a death of a loved one, you're wondering, you're hoping if ever things will be normal again. If you've ever had a, a serious illness or something you've been battling, you wonder, will I ever be normal again? You know, that is, is, is that going to be, you know, no matter how serious this, that our circumstances are, remember that they are always subject to change and we can have hope okay if you've ever been going through a hard time financially we can have hope you know if we want to move to a safer neighborhood or if we want to get off of zoe mountain you know and and we can have hope hope okay all right okay number one hope is a force that what overcomes. 1 John 5, 4 and 5 says, for whatever is born of God is victorious over the world and this is the victory that conquers the world, even our faith. Who is it that is victorious over that conquers the world but he who believes that Jesus is the son of God who adheres to, trust in, and relies on that fact. Okay? We have residing on the inside of us if we're born again, Look at somebody and say, are you born again? <laughs> Donna, did you ask him? Did he respond? Okay, yeah, he's tearing, tearing up. I knew he would be. There are three forces that are in us, okay, if we have those things. They have the power to help us overcome any circumstances and change anything in our lives. So what are they? 1 Corinthians 13, 13 tells us. And now abide faith, hope, and love, these three but the greatest of these is what? Love. Okay? They are inseparable and they together, working together, they have the power to put us on top. Okay? But getting our copes up is the key to putting faith and love to work in our lives. Without that anchor of hope, we can need that will help us anchor ourselves on who and whose we are so that we're not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine so we can, we can focus on that faith and that love because the greatest of these is walking in love even in the midst of all of those things because sometimes we can get weary in well-doing, okay? Faith, help, and love are the answers, okay? Now, this is the uh, second one. Hope is a force that already comes. This is the first one. Second one is hope is already in us. 
And to prove that, we'll go to Ephesians through, through. Ephesians through, that was King James. Ephesians through. <laughs> Ephesians 2, 12, okay? Remember that you are at that point separated, living apart from Christ, excluded from all part in him, utterly estranged and outlawed from the rights of Israel as a nation, and strangers with no share in the sacred compacts of the messianic uh, promise, okay? And um, with no knowledge of a right in God's agreements, his covenants, and you had no hope, no promise, you were in the world without God. So most people understand how crucial, okay, faith is, but they don't understand how important that hope is, okay? Regardless of what we feel hopeless about, the truth remains, we do have hope if we have God. And you got to remember, he said he would never leave us or what? Forsake us. Never, never, never in the midst of everything, never leave us. You know, our sake is. So we don't go by what we feel. We go by what we read in the word and by each and every situation. Okay. And we can always say, thank God I still got hope. Okay. It's not a lack of education. It's not a lack of money. There are a lack of opportunity. Hopelessness comes from being without hope and without God in the world. You know, that is the place where I run across so many people, you know, that need help. They have no hope. They are desperate for that. And the reason is they don't have Jesus in their lives. They don't have anything to rely on. They don't know whose or whose they are or whom they are in Christ Jesus. There's a lot of people that's, that go to church that still don't know Jesus. They think that they're born again, but again, they may have made the confession with their mouths and done that, but they have not pursued that word. They have not decided to put that word and they wonder why everything's happening and why they feel desperate all the time. That's because getting in the word of God and getting that foundation and stirring that up and realizing that we have this hope in us already. Okay? We have God. We have hope. All right? So hope is a force that overcomes. Two, hope is already in us. Three, hope isn't a wish. Okay? It's not a wish. All right? Philippians 1, 20 through 21. So this is in keeping with my own eager desire and persistent expectation and hope that I shall not disgrace myself nor be put to shame in anything, but that with the utmost freedom of speech and unfailing courage, now as always heretofore, Christ the Messiah will be magnified and get glory and praise in this body of mine and be boldly exalted in my person, whether through by life or through by death. Okay? And he says... For to me, to live is Christ, his life in me, and to die is what? The gain, the gain of the glory of eternity. Bible hopes not wishing. That's the worldly hope we talked about. You know, I hope we get the raise. I hope this happens. I hope that happens. They don't really mean it. The kind of hope that's described here is an earnest expectation. It is a knowing. Again, it is not... You remember the movie Hope Floats? I didn't see it. Okay. Anybody see that? Okay. You saw it? You sissy. <laughs> I'm messing with you. I didn't get to see it. But I always thought Hope Floats. I said, because I always thought that Hope was an anchor. It was under, something underneath the surface that would, would hold us in place. You know, that, that no matter what, no matter what, the waves are bringing and, and tossing us, trying to toss us to and fro with everything, that that hope was still my anchor because there was an earnest expectation of no matter what, that, you know, that Jesus is still there, his word is still working, and that the answer is coming. So, you know, that is that earnest expectation. That is what hope is, okay? It's a really, really, really strong, strong force, okay? All right? And, boom, that kind of hope, describing the words, is based on our covenant with God and the anointing he has provided to carry out that covenant in our lives. Do you not know, and we should know, that we are covenant partners? That carries a greater, greater in-depth meaning than, well, yeah, I'm born again, you know. But no, we are covenant partners. It's been cut in the blood of Jesus. 
That blood has completely washed, disintegrated sin once and for all. And we have a place in the kingdom of God because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how powerful that is. Covenants are always cut in blood. The blood covenants. You remember the old times, the things they used to do. I mean, we have the most powerful covenant that there is. And because we're born again, we're covenant people. Therefore, we got covenant rights and privileges. And that hope can be that anchor for everything that's going on. Okay. Next point. Number one, hope is a force that overcomes. Hope is already in us. Hope isn't a wish. Number four, hope is always at what? Work. Okay. In Romans 8.25. For if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance and patience. It is a supernatural expectancy that's on the inside of us. Okay. All right. Because when we expect something good, we are operating in hope that comes from the truth of God's holy word. Okay, this is our covenant in print. Okay, this, he said to hide it in our hearts. He said to meditate on it daily. He said to spend time in it. If we don't spend time in it, we will be ill-equipped to believe that Zoe Mountain is going to sell when everything and everybody says it can't sell. We're, if anything that we're believing, trusting for, when people come and say, man, you're stupid, you're silly for believing that, the only thing we can fall back on is says, uh, the word of God says that by his stripes, I was already healed. When we get that word, oh, you've got cancer, the big C word, which I hate. And I'll tell you a quick story. Some of you heard it before. My brother-in-law is married to my sister. And, um, you know, we'll start with my sister first. She had these mangiomes on the brain. And back then they had no idea what it was. My brother first had it. He had one. They cut it out. Had no idea what was going on with it. And, you know, he's... He does fine. He's got a family and everything, but he, he can't move. He's got a walker and everything because they damaged a bunch of stuff in him. But he's alive and well. My sister had five of these mangiomes on her brain, and they went in for a 16-hour surgery to remove them. Okay? In that, my brother-in-law, we were all in prayer, you know, and um, his mom did not know anything about the word. She was trying to be nice for him. She goes, just, just let her go, Kent. Just let her go. Just let her go, okay? It's God's will that she dies now. You know? I was angry. I knew it wasn't her, but I knew the spirit behind it. I kicked her out of the prayer room. And I had to take this and encourage him. Because he was fairly new in the things of God, in the word of God. Okay? So, my other sister-in-law was... The nurse in the operating room, she come out five times, says, we've lost her again. She died on the table five times, okay? In result, my sister, who was supposed to come um, in a couple of weeks, they, some, we're, they're coming next year, they have a ministry now. She's alive and well, um, you know, has two fine sons. And, um, but... The doctor told her if she would stand, this was not a born-again doctor, but she would stand in the mirror every day and tell her eyebrows to work, her mouth to work, and all her arms and everything to work, that they would work. That's what he told her. And she did until she got functional, then she quit. And to this day, she still has a little bit, she's fully functional, got grandkids and all of that. Her first husband, okay, this is the mother of the first husband that she had, he ended up with cancer. I'll never forget the day when we were in Indiana and we found out about it. And it was my two daughters, their two sons, and um, um, Kevin and Marla and Andrea and I, we went in there, laid hands on him. We spoke, we cursed cancer at the root. He, he didn't know anything about this. He started shaking and trembling because he was raised in the same Methodist church I was. He was shaking and trembling and he goes, I said, what is that? I said, what are you feeling? He goes, it feels like hot oil coming down on the top of my head all the way through my body. I said, I said, yeah. I said, that's the anointing. He goes, whoa. 
I said, how's that feel? He goes, I'm hot. I said, good. That's why my sister married you. She said you were hot. <laughs> In that, he came down, you know, um, during the summer, looking great, looking good. You know, tall, blue, high, blue-eyed guy, you know, handsome, blonde-haired guy. And we prayed over some, some more, uh, gave him some word. And he went back to work. And um, three months later, I had given him scriptures to read, to retrain his mind, to retrain everything. Three months later, I get a call from my sister, can you come? I said, what's going on? She goes, Kent is in um, ICU. They don't expect him to live through the night. And come to find out, his mom had told him, son, don't fight this. This is God's way of getting you out, you know. You don't want to try to battle this. It's going to hurt a lot. And that word that was spoken to him that way, as opposed to the word of God, you know, is what led to his ultimate death and his demise. Okay, now those are my situations that I know of. Everybody has a different situation. But that hope that he first had in him was ripped out of him by somebody else who was just being... They were kind as a mom. She loved her son, you know, but she didn't know anything about covenant. She didn't know anything about what the word of God said. She didn't know anything about the power of the words that Jesus said that we had when we speak. She didn't understand the function. And wonderful lady, wonderful lady. So she's still alive today, but she lost her husband to cancer as well, you know, and it was about two years after the son died. And uh, so, you know, those things... We have broken those things over our, their children and our grandchildren because those things come down with a curse. We have a new covenant based on better promises because of the blood of Jesus and the stripes of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sis, you know what it took to stand. You were that close to dying. You knew that. They told you that. Your son wouldn't quit. You wouldn't quit because you're extremely stubborn. But you also know who you are in Christ Jesus. Look at her today. You know, she's thriving. She's thriving. You know, I know the word of God is, it's real. Amen. <laughs> we won't get into this. I get, I get so passionate about it. So I hate the devil. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to destroy marriages. He wants to destroy lives. He wants to destroy hopes. He wants to steal our dreams. He wants to steal our visions. That's what he's after. He's after our children. He's after our grandchildren. But he doesn't know, you know, that we know who we are. And he's messing with the wrong people. And once we stand up, and decide and declare and decree that I'm telling you the word of God will not return void. If we will stay firmly planted in that anchor of hope. Band, I need you to come on up and get ready for this song, please. Okay. Firmly planted. Okay. Supernatural hope knows what God has provided and expects it with eager confidence. Here's the last one. Hope is a force that overcomes. Hope is already in us. Hope isn't a wish. Hope is always at work. Gospel hope always wins. Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping. In Romans 4.18, who, contrary to hope, in hope believe, so that he what? Became the father of how many nations? According to what was spoken, so shall your ascendants be. He had to choose between natural hope and gospel hope. And he knew that gospel hope always, always wins. Okay? Now, we're going to do this song by Lauren Daigle. And I'm going to show you the words of it first and go over them with you. Okay? It says, I keep finding voices in my mind that say I'm not enough. We've all been there. Every single lie that tells me I will never measure up. Am I more than just the sum of every high and every low? 
Remind me once again just who I am because I need to know. You say I am loved when I can't feel a thing. God, you say I am strong when I think I am weak. God, you say I'm held when I am falling short. When I don't belong, oh, you say that I am yours. And I believe. Oh, I believe what you say of me. I believe. Because the only thing that matters now is everything you think of me. In you I find my worth. And in you I find my identity. You say I'm loved when I can't feel a thing. You say I'm strong when I think I am weak. And you say I'm held when I am falling short. When I believe. You turn those lights down, folks. We're going to minister this to you.